warmly welcome you all to uh, this uh, important and exciting meeting that we're about to have. We have some of the world's leading specialists with us to share their thoughts. And our goal is to make this as open as possible. So lots of opportunity to uh, raise issues, ask questions and so on. So today we're looking at the issue of accelerating the transition. We come at the end of a couple of extraordinary weeks on the ocean. Last week, there were 54 separate um, uh, meetings on the ocean at a time when we should have been having the ocean summit, but unfortunately we could not. Um, and so what we're lo looking at today is, is two things essentially. First, what would it really mean to get the transition that we need in the governance of the ocean in the right place? What can we learn from other transitions what do we need to do to move this forward with the urgency it requires? Then the second thing we're going to look at is the whole question of we find ourselves now in an astonishing crisis period, a health crisis, an economic crisis, and an equity crisis, a racial equity crisis as well. What are the implications for this, for the way we think about the kind of transformation that we need with regard uh, to the ocean? And so, um, so what we're going to do is here, we're, let me just uh, tell you who's going to be uh, uh, speaking today. Uh, Ambassador Peter Thompson, who as you all know, is the Secretary General's Special Envoy for the Ocean, driving forward uh, this initiative at the global level. And then we're going to have a, a panel of uh, remarkable uh, leaders in this space, Vidar Helgeson, and many of you knew him as Minister of Environment, and now he's the Special Representative for the Ocean. Um, and also uh, leading the charge in many ways with regard to the high-level panel on the ocean. We then have Olai Uludong, who is the permanent representative of Pulau, the two co-chairs of the, uh, the high-level panel, the Prime Minister of Norway and the President of Pulau. We then have Jane Lubchenko, who is a distinguished professor at Oregon State University, one of the most cited, perhaps the most cited ecologists in the world on ocean issues and has been overseeing uh, the expert group driving forward the so-called blue papers. Then Dr. Mary Ruckleshouse, who is the lead author of the paper we are launching uh, today, and she's also the managing director of the Natural Capital, um, Pro uh, Natural Capital Project at uh, Stanford University and uh, a professor there. So, so what exactly is the high-level panel on the ocean? It's a very uh, unique uh, set of global leaders uh, at the head of state, head of government level, 14 uh, leading countries in the world with regard to the ocean. They account for 30% of the world's coastlines. They account for 30% of the world's exclusive economic zones, 20% of the world's shipping fleet, and 20% of the world's fisheries. So this is a group of leaders that speaks with authority and they are working uh, uh, hard, uh, have been over the last year, um, to come up with a whole set of um, imperatives that they are going to take the lead on. Um, in terms of sort of the approach of the high level panel, five sort of uh, guiding principles, if you like, um, it is people, humanity's relationship with the ocean. Um, it is the people that both have caused ocean problems, it is people who benefit from the ocean, and it is people that need to be the solution to the ocean problem. Second, um, the issue of knowledge. Um, uh, knowledge is growing at an amazing pace. Data is doubling every couple of years on the ocean. And so the idea is to bring the very best scientists from all around the world to make sure we are learning as we are accumulating data and knowledge. A third, um, focusing on diverse stakeholders. This is not just a bunch of experts. This has to involve and has involved um, local communities, those who are closest uh, to the ocean. And very, very importantly, fourth, this is really about a narrative that brings the economy together with the ocean. Um, just as in the case of, say, climate change, where you know, five years ago, people believed that there was a trade-off between climate action and uh, the economy. We now know actually that smart climate action leads to more economic efficiency, new technologies, it lowers risks. Combined, these lead to a better economy, to more jobs, 
to better tech, uh, to, to better competitiveness um, and, and higher um, human well-being. Exactly the same applies to the ocean, but it's never been documented before. We've never done the kind of analysis that the high-level panel is doing. And so a major report is under preparation. And finally, an action agenda for a, a really major transition. We've been losing the battle on the ocean and we need a pretty disciplined um, approach moving forward. So now it's my uh, pleasure to um, introduce um, uh, Ambassador Peter Thompson, um, a distinguished Fijian who was ambassador for Fiji to the United Nations. He became president of the General Assembly, leading things forward there. Now he is the uh, Secretary General's um, special envoy, and Peter's going to set a few things in context for us. Thank you very much, Peter. So thank you, Andrew, and uh, greetings to everyone gathered here with us in cyberspace. First of all, wherever and whatever your circumstances, I do hope that you and your families are safe and well. Now look, in these opening remarks for today's event, I'd like to bend your minds in the direction of the solutions rather than the fierce problems that we're facing. So please allow me to quickly state the basic problems and then I'll move on to what I see as the ways for us to overcome. You've heard me say it many times before, but I'll say it again today. Without a healthy ocean, we cannot have a healthy planet. And at the moment, the health of the ocean is in decline. Therefore, the great task of our times is to reverse that cycle of decline. If we're not willing to take on the task, the basic truth is that we're thereby putting it upon those who are coming after us to suffer the consequences, namely escalating frequency and severity of environmental disasters with immense implications for human security. I firmly believe that we have all the ideas and resources we need to succeed at the task. The only wobbly element is, politically, uh, is political will. And I use the term political will in its broadest sense, from the mindsets of the leaders of nations, great and small, through to the corporations and commodity owners, right down to the everyday decision-making of local communities and individuals. So yes, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that means that the wobbly element touches upon you and me. I'll make two more quick points about the problem side. Firstly, what are the causes of the ocean's declining health? For ease of thought, let's pare them down to six. One, our harmful fishing practices, which includes overfishing, illegal fishing, subsidizing overcapacity of fishing fleets, and unsustainable aquaculture. Two, Marine pollution, some of which comes from our ships and from the incredible noise we impose upon the marine environment, but most of which originates from our activities on land and what flows down into the sea in the form of plastic, 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 untreated sewerage, industrial chemicals, excess fertilizers and nutrients. Three, the habitat destruction that is caused by cutting mangroves and destroying kelp forests and seagrass meadows, bottom trawling and other seafloor intrusions. Four, steadily increasing ocean acidification, making it harder for calcium carbonate dependent creatures like shellfish to live normal lives. Five, the ever decreasing levels of oxygen in the ocean, adding further stress to life under the waves. And six, ocean warming, causing death of coral, movement of species from traditional habitats and rising sea levels. The first three, fishing pollution and habitat loss can be characterized as man management problems. While the second three, Citification, deoxygenation, and warming are intrinsically linked to our greenhouse gas emissions. The second point is that we have the big predicament. The IPCC's report on the consequences of exceeding a 1.5 degrees Celsius global warming tells us that we lose the ocean's coral reefs once we go through the dreaded line of two degrees. Coral reefs are home to 30% of the ocean's biodiversity. What would such loss mean for the ocean's health? I think we're going to agree it would not be good. And you've already heard that we can't have a healthy planet without a healthy ocean. That's bad, but it's not the big predicament. The big predicament is that we aren't heading towards 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius. The IPCC and WMO have confirmed global warming will be at well over 3 degrees before the end of this century, if current conditions and trends prevail. As the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, put it in his speech, at the Blue Cop in Madrid last December, 
we are knowingly destroying the life support systems of this planet. That is why I sometimes say that the future of humankind and coral may be intimately linked. Okay, I think you've all got the outline of the problems. What is the story with the solutions? So ladies and gentlemen, the solutions to our fisheries problems are pretty straightforward. Stop the harmful practices, everybody. If we're going to continue to be consumers of wild stock fish, we have to base the industry on strict principles of science-based management. Never catch or consume illegal fish. Prohibit the harmful subsidies that are causing overcapacity in the fishing industry. Support small-scale artisanal fishers. Establish marine protected areas and invest in sustainable aquaculture and other new uh, sustainable sources of marine-based nutrition. Let's just do it. Likewise with pollution. Do the dogged necessary in applying the source to sea ethos to our land-based industries, agriculture, sewerage, and waste management. And on plastic, the mantra of refuse, reduce, recycle, must be inculcated into the minds of young and old for consumers have immense power. The future lies in making good use of all that plastic waste clogging our drains and rivers, blowing down the back streets of our towns and cities, compressed in layer upon layer of indestructible unsightliness in landfills, rubbish dumps around the world, not to mention the permeation of the food chain with the plague of plastic microbeads and microfibers that we've unleashed upon the environment. There is enough of the stuff already existing on the planet to meet most of our justifiable needs for it. So value it, collect it, and recycle it, and we will prove that no more virgin plastic is required from the oil industry, thank you very much. As to value, make polluters pay for the effects of their practices and products, and we'll soon establish comparable value. When it comes to the biggest cause of the decline of the ocean's health, we are unavoidably confronted by anthropogenic greenhouse gases, the cause of ocean acidification, deoxygenation and warming. What are we gonna to do to stop the self-destructive madness? To answer that question, you have to ask another one. How are you, your community, your company, your country going to get to net zero carbon by 2050? Climate science has made it clear to us that in order to halt the climate change, we have to achieve a net zero carbon footprint. In other words, carbon neutrality within the next 30 years. We can do that by balancing our carbon emissions with carbon removal or by simply eliminating carbon emissions altogether. Succeed in this quest and we will overcome the main cause of oceans declining health, thereby saving coral and maybe ourselves. The ocean has a role to play in the transition to a carbon neutral world. The expert report, the ocean as a solution to climate change, five opportunities for action, which was commissioned by the high level panel for a sustainable ocean economy sets out ocean-based climate action, which by 2050 can cumulatively reduce the so-called emissions gap by up to 21% on a 1.5 degrees Celsius pathway. I commend the report to you because of its positive contribution on the myriad of solutions ready to activate. Ocean-based renewable energy technologies, the greening of ocean-based transport, nature-based solutions, including the conservation and restoration of mangroves, salt marshes, sea grasses that store carbon so effectively, along with sustainable growth in seafood production and consumption, particularly from aquaculture. Apply similar so solutions to what we're doing on land and we will get to net zero by 2050. Many of us indeed believe that we're on the doorstep of an infrastructure transformation on a scale unseen since the industrial revolution. Clean energy, decarbonized industry and transport, rationalized food systems and smart buildings are queuing at the door for implementation. Application of the right science, planning and finance, and we'll get there. But we do have urgent work to do. Ladies and gentlemen, finance. We all know that governments and corporations are facing extremely difficult financial decisions at this time of planning and managing the economic recovery from the coronavirus pandemic. And we're all aware that prolonged global economic slowdown runs the associated risk of reduced commitment to climate action. This cannot be allowed to occur. And I've already provided two examples, the death of coral and rising sea levels, which demonstrate why such backward movement would not be in humanity's best interests. This is the time when decisions on massive financial commitments are in train. And before the seal is set upon them, 
we have to ensure that the consequences of taking a low road back to the global warming, fossil fuel dependent, plastic polluting world we knew are understood and avoided. This is the time that our voices should be heard in favor of the high green road and the transition to that uh, green future. Uh, a road I like to call a blue green recovery road. A time when governments around the world must look beyond the short term and put in place equitable policies and investment decisions that are in harmony with a truly sustainable future. I thank you for your attention and I hand the virtual microphone back to you, Andrew. Thank you so much, Ambassador Peter Thompson. A wonderful scene setting there, um, compelling. Uh, we now turn to the um, presentation of the paper. Um, let me remind you that this uh, is one of 16 so-called blue papers that are being prepared, being prepared by groups of scientists, each paper prepared by the leading uh, scientists in that particular area. So far, 10 of them have come out. And the recommendations and commitments that the heads of state will be making will in turn be based upon um, this sort of accumulation of knowledge and ideas that comes from these um, 16 papers. I'd like to remind you, I'm sure you don't need much reminding um, how to use Zoom. <laughs> um, uh, uh, please go to the Q&A button. And uh, if you've got any comments, if you've got any questions, please type them in there. And we will then use that to, if you like, guide the conversation we're going to have with the panelists uh, after this presentation. So Dr. Dr. Mary Ruckelshaus, um, I mentioned before, she leads the um, Natural Capital Project, which is a really transformative project to sort of think through, really, if we took natural capital seriously, how would we act differently? Um, and she's at Stanford University, so she's going to present it. And each of these papers brings together the, the technology, the economics, the sociology, the governance, the finance, uh, with the idea of sort of putting the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle together. This particular paper is, um, it sort of stands alone in the sense that it takes a really big look at ocean governance. So with that, over to you, Mary. Thank you so much, Andrew. And yes, I'm very happy to be here today. Thanks everyone for joining on the webinar. And I do want to say that this, what I'll be presenting just now is a group effort of my co-authors that you can see here. So we all learned a lot from one another in this process. And I think our diverse author team really, uh, really is a mark of how much we have to learn from one another in different disciplines as well as different sectors. So our blue paper uh, really makes the case that a new system of ocean governance is needed to bolster life on Earth through the many benefits that the ocean provides. So we know that oceans are intrinsically linked to all of our Earth's ecosystems on land, in rivers, in deltas, and estuaries. And climate is also a key part of this intricate web. The ocean we think of as a global commons so this is a shared resource, a public good, and its community. And that global commons, all of our human prosperity and well-being depends. So just one example of this interconnectedness of the ocean, this little picture you can see here. Um, I just want to remind us all that fish don't pay attention to borders. For instance, this local fisher folk in this picture may be following their government's fishing guidelines but the fish they are catching may have originated in other waters, in other nations' waters, and likely traverse parts of the open ocean, this global commons. Similarly, plastic pollution, as Andrew and the ambassador have mentioned, in the open ocean can come from many places, many nations on land or on ships. So these interconnections really showcase how we really need to start thinking about them and how we govern. So our paper uses transition theory and we assess current sector-based governance and showcase compelling examples of needed innovations that are outside of conventional management and we suggest in order to transition to a more sustainable economy that a more holistic approach is needed. So this slide shows essentially the problem statement and Ambassador Thompson laid this out so well 
But the, the crux from our view is that the way the ocean is currently governed is weak and fragmented. It consists of a diverse, a diverse set of institutions that are responsible for designing solutions for common resources in the ocean, but they tend to be organized by sectors so that you can see just a few of those diverse sectors here. So they're really part of a highly complex system. And complex systems are such that small perturbations can have disproportionately large system-wide impacts, all evidenced by our recent COVID-19 crisis. And the current pandemic demonstrates the necessity to build the kind of resilience that enables effective, agile, and just and equitable responses to these sudden system changes. So this is especially true for the ocean in the complex system that we all depend on. So in order for governance in the ocean to be legitimate, it needs to reflect the norms and values of the society in which it operates and it depends on it. So our paper, we bring a stewardship mindset and this fosters the sustainable use of ecosystems and resources by society in the context of rapid and frequently abrupt change. So now more than ever, we need to understand complex systems and how they can be made more resilient for the benefit of people, the economy and the environment. And we think we've got a way to do that based on what all of us are already doing. So how can humans bring about this needed transition to a more sustainable ocean system? So we found growing realization that three things need to change. One is humans relationship with nature and the ocean. And the second is the humans relationship with each other and especially how we use information technologies that are inclusive and diverse ways of knowing to enable us to collaborate across geographies rather than compete for dwindling ocean resources and benefits. And the third thing is that the relationships between nations need to change and that we need to work more within a multilateral system. So this transition can be purposeful, but it's not an inevitable outcome. So the first thing we need is a clear vision. This is a, it's a combined top down and bottom up dynamic that we think needs to occur here. So a clear vision is needed for the changes required and what does this future look like and what is the pathway that we can use to get to that future? That'll be bringing about changes which considers legal frameworks, knowledge, and also incentives and guiding principles. We can't just assume this will happen on its own. So this top-down and bottom-up dynamic that we see is that existing regime actors, so these would be individuals, for example, located within a particular sector like shipping. So it could include decision makers, consumers, regulators, and funders. These individual actors need to respond to threats in the ocean, such as climate change, and coordinate their responses across sectors. Then the bottom up part is that networks of innovators come together to create and share knowledge and science-based solutions that can scale up and across the ocean realm. And possibly later on, these new, these innovations can even coalesce into new regimes that are more responsive. So new modes of governance that are integrated, inclusive and adaptive are essential to collaboratively managing the ocean as humanity shared commons. And I'm gonna show you next an example of what we find around the world in incredible innovations that actually are occurring that we think we can draw upon to get on this transition to a more sustainable ocean system. So I'm going to tell you a quick story about National Coastal Development Planning in Belize. Um, my group at Natural Capital Project worked with the Coastal Zone Management Authority and Institute, which is an interministerial government agency that's charged with creating an integrated coastal zone management plan. So they had a legal mandate in this country to do this integration. And the plan was focused on achieving three objectives that were critical to Belizeans. Increase and bolster their tourism economy, which is the biggest economy in Belize, support both artisanal and commercial fisheries, and also protect their valuable coastal 
assets, so roads, homes, hospitals, tourism development, from sea level rise and storms. So all of these three sectors integrating to support a sustainable thriving economy and communities. So after working for many years together in a science policy engagement process designed by the Belizean government, they approved a coastal zone plan which is now being implemented. It's in its fourth year. As part of this plan, the government realized they needed to form a new ministry. So they started adapting their governance. And this Ministry of Agricultural Fisheries, Forestry, the Environment and Sustainable Development, that's a mouthful, but it recognizes the cross-sectoral management needs that are critical to achieving their shared vision. And the process was just, as our theory suggests, it was both top-down, where the government worked with stakeholders to develop a shared vision, but also bottom up. So local planning groups designed how they would each contribute to these shared national goals. And local knowledge and experience in each of these regional groups drove the innovation and the support, the, the great public support for the plan. So the outcome is an integrated nature-based approach. It's more cost effective in achieving the tourism, fisheries, and coastal protection goals that they laid out. And they are focusing now on get, developing this thriving society that is underpinned by coral reefs, mangroves, and seagrass systems that are healthy. So the next step is that Belize is adapting. So they're in the process of initiating an evaluation of their plan. So at the five-year mark, they will understand what's working and what's not working. And there's also great scope to start sharing the lessons that they're learning with a broader communities around the world who are doing similar planning and share lessons from Belize, but also with other countries. And there's also real interest in bringing in private sector stewardship and incentives so that the public effort can be supported and enhanced by private sector um, investments as well as stewardship. So Belize's example is just one of many around the world. And looking at these innovations, we can be um, I think very optimistic that we can find a pathway to this transition that we all look for. So the ocean is a resource for all humanity, as you've heard the panel members already talk about, and its life support systems are suffering because of uncoordinated and complex governance. So stewardship approaches, including both top-down guiding principles and amplification of bottom-up innovation and adaptive learning can really provide a path to this more sustainable state we all desire. So our, my co-authors and I identified four opportunities for action that could really get us on this path. And the first is for national governments, businesses, and civil society can support the current UN ocean transition processes by supporting agreements such as the United Nations Law of the Sea and the Treaty for Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction, which is currently being negotiated in the UN, among many other UN processes that we think are really worth supporting. These collectively create frameworks for global governance of areas of the ocean that fall within and outside of national jurisdictions. The current debt pandemic is demonstrating the importance of this coordinated and evidence-based global action to a shared challenge. The second opportunity is to reconfigure nation state authority as it relates to the ocean. For example, by establishing an overarching ocean body that could support polycentric governance or this very broad networked governance and scaling up of these bottom-up innovations. This would complement the strong nation state governance for activities and policies within state boundaries on land and in coastal waters, um, which we think would really bring about the a sustainable path to redress the inequalities in the distribution and sharing of both harms and benefits. So Civil society and communities can play a more significant role in promoting the restoration and sustainability of the ocean commons. So this would require increased investment in innovations at the local, regional, and global scales. 
It also, we think, would really benefit from creation of an ocean knowledge commons. And this is an open source wiki type shared information mechanism that collates crowdsourced and satellite data, creates a clearinghouse for algorithms from the science community and shared strategies that amplify best practices, share cautionary tales, and really help accelerate viable working alternatives. And many of these pieces are underway already, and we think a more coordinated effort here would be really helpful. And the final opportunity is to integrate property rights with stewardship responsibilities. For example, by establishing local user rights programs and building trust through accountable certification schemes. <clears throat> and we talk in our blue paper about the CBOS example, which is a wonderful one in the fishing and food production industry, and also the Chilean uh, territorial user rights fisheries case where the rights have been established in ocean systems for a long time and lots of lessons learned there. So I'll stop here, but I wanted to thank you for this opportunity to share the ideas and also thank all of my co-authors for a really fruitful collaboration. Thank you, Mary, so much. A wonderful presentation, great report. Uh, let me remind everybody that uh, these reports are now on the website of the High Level Panel on the Ocean Economy. If you'd like to receive notifications um, of each paper as they come out, um, please um, uh, go to the website and, uh, and uh, ask for that and they will make sure that happens. So the transition and, uh, governance needs to be integrated, inclusive, adaptive, um, and, and what a great example uh, you gave there, uh, Mary. Thank you so much. Let's, um, let's turn to the panel now. I understand that Olai uh, Uludong has had, is having trouble getting on, so I'm not sure if she's on yet. I don't think she is, in which case we'll, we'll press ahead anyway. And let's begin with, um, with Jane uh, Lubchenko. Um, uh, many of us uh, uh, knew her and watched her when she was head of NOAA here in the United States uh, under President Obama um, and uh, did an amazing job there and now is a professor uh, at Oregon and as I said before, chair of the expert group. Um, uh, it, as, a, as a scientist, Jane, as you listen to this about sort of governance and where we need to go, we've talked about the tragedy of the commons for many, many years, you know, Eleanor Ostrom, uh, who was the first um, woman to win the Nobel Prize in economics, she showed actually it doesn't need to be so tragic if we, if we, if we get things right. How do you as a scientist sort of relate to a paper like this? And do you feel that this current crisis we're in economically and health-wise can, can actually help sort of open doors, if you like? Thank you, Andrew. And I really want to uh, acknowledge my co-chairs uh, of the expert group, uh, uh, Peter uh, Hogan and also Mary Pengestu. Uh, but uh, to your question, uh, you began, Andrew, by really focusing our attention on the multiple crises that are underway today. And I think that is exactly uh, how we need to be thinking about this. People are, I, I believe there's heightened awareness about the interconnectedness of our world, about how people are connected to one another but also how people are connected to nature and how uh, our economies are so connected to our health, to uh, our uh, communities. Uh, and this interconnectedness is really uh, providing an opportunity, an opportunity for us to think differently. So we have heightened awareness about how our world works and a special moment in time to act on that knowledge and to create new uh, pathways to connect the dots better, if you will. And this paper focusing on ocean transitions could not come at a more opportune time. It really provides deep content and wise guidance about how we can move ahead to connect people with one another, to connect people with ocean ecosystems and ocean ecosystems with our economies. They are deeply interconnected. And that provides us 
with an opportunity to be much smarter about how we act from here on out. This is a moment that we really need to take seriously. The focus on governance is very appropriate with a, both a top-down uh, increasing call for lead, I mean, an increasing call for leadership so that we have the right structures that are top down, but also uh, more participatory, meaningful, bottom up interactions. This is a very exciting time, actually. And as a scientist, I'm thrilled by this uh, opportunity that we have to move forward and create a world that is more uh, connected. Wonderful. Thank you, Jane, very much indeed. So I, I'll ask just a few questions to uh, Jane and Vida and Olai if she, if she comes, but then we're going to um, open it up to questions. I see people are starting to populate the Q&A button there, so please feel free uh, to do so. Um, Vida Helgeson, um, who together with uh, Ambassador Olai has led the, uh, the work um, and driven the work of the high-level panel as the special representative. I want everybody to know in case you didn't hear it, he just this week was appointed to a, a very prestigious and important job as uh, head of the Nobel Foundation. So hearty congratulations, uh, Vida, but uh, you're still going to be, you're still, yes, I hear a round of applause there. Um, <laughs> you're still, you are still going to um, be leading the ocean work at least until next January. And so, um, so we are counting on you. So, um, Vida, um, if we're going to make the kind of progress we're talking about on, on governance, we obviously need political will at a very, very high level. And that's why the high level panel is so important, heads of state level. What, what are you really hoping for? Uh, give us the inside scoop. Um, and do you feel that the leaders of the world are ready for the kind of change that is required? Well, I certainly hope so. And uh, certainly the 14 sitting and serving presidents and prime ministers on the high level panel have come together exactly to point to actions needed for the necessary transformation or the necessary transition. And uh, as the title of this webinar speaks to, we really need to accelerate that transition. And in this COVID situation, uh, there's much talk about recovery, uh, but we shouldn't talk about a recovery as going back to normal. We need to uh, accelerate a transition into something better. And when it comes to the ocean, as Mary, uh, with her excellent uh, paper and her co-authors have pointed to, and as Jane just said, there is so much, uh, there are so many connections. Uh, ocean ecosystems are interconnected. Um, the way human impacts interact with uh, ocean ecosystems make, uh, make even more connections. And then, meanwhile, governance is often quite disconnected. Um, and if we are to achieve more connectivity of governance, more collaboration across sectors, um, sectors in businesses and ocean industries that tend now to be driving their own agenda, uh, and sectors within government. Uh, political will is really needed because if you don't have that political will to take stewardship, lead, coordinate, ensure integration, uh, sectors will often be left to their own devices, whether they're in industry uh, or in um, governments or even in science for that matter. So uh, I think the, the call here for connectivity uh, of governance uh, is really one that is calling for political leadership. Great, thank you, Vida, very much. I'd like to probe a little bit, both of you, um, this point that Jane made, you know, we, we face these multiple crises and everybody now is talking about how do we build back better? Um, so lots of, in the environmental field, lots of effort to think through, you know, could we use this massive stimulus of 20, 10 to $20 trillion, you know, could we use it to, uh, to promote green energy? Could we, how about nature-based solutions? How about energy efficiency and so on? But obviously there's some pretty important links here to the ocean. 
uh, you, uh, Jane, as, a, as one of the co-chairs of the, of the uh, expert group, together with, I should have mentioned, Marie Pangestu, who, um, who is one of the leading economists from, from Indonesia, was Minister of Trade there, and now has just become the Managing Director of the, uh, of the World Bank. How, how are you thinking about this, including the issue of resilience? I mean, obviously, we've been reminded by the current crisis that we're not as safe as we thought we were. We need a much more resilient world going forward and we need to start with the ocean probably. Yes, Andrew, I think there really are some amazing opportunities that uh, are before us. Um, I, uh, I would focus on two that uh, have sort of been themes cutting through a lot of the blue papers. One is protecting and restoring coastal ecosystems and a second, is seeing the ocean as a solution to climate change. Uh, so the first one, protecting and restoring ecosystems. Uh, we are learning how incredibly important healthy, productive, resilient ecosystems are to our economies and to our own well-being. And uh, the opportunity to protect and restore some ecosystems that are being lost at a uh, frenetic pace, uh, an opportunity to protect those and to restore them is just the low hanging fruit of the portfolio of opportunities that we have. Habitats such as uh, wetlands, mangroves, uh, coral reefs, seagrass beds are incredibly important to people, but also uh, to our economies. Uh, for example, mangrove ecosystems, seagrass ecosystems, coral reef ecosystems are nursery habitats for many important fisheries. They also provide recreational opportunities and opportunities for job creation. One very important function of mangroves, for example, or wetlands is also to dampen uh, storm surge uh, from uh, either uh, from uh, coastal storms. And these functions are being lost, uh, but the opportunity to protect these key areas and restore them is just a golden one. I'm reminded of in, 20, in 2009 in the United States, when we really had a very serious economic crisis uh, Congress passed the Stimulus Act, which was intended to infuse a lot of cash into the kinds of activities that would uh, bring back the economy quickly. And at NOAA, when I was administrator in 2009, we had $650 million to do habitat restoration grants, that, but they had to have three immediate, uh, they had to fulfill three criteria. They had to be shovel ready, so ready to go. They had to have economic benefits, so create jobs immediately. And finally, they had to have long-term economic and environmental benefit uh, because they were bringing back healthy uh, habitats. That $650 million, we did a quick uh, call for proposals and in no time got $2 billion, $3 billion worth of proposals. And that told me that there was just a huge untapped potential to uh, protect and restore these habitats in ways that, that connected the dots between the economy, between the environment, and between social benefit. Moreover, when we actually ran the numbers, we discovered compared to uh, the funds in the Stimulus Act that had been spent on other kinds of activities, that this creation, protecting and restoring ocean, habit, or ocean coastal uh, habitats actually created more than two times the number of jobs than any other uh, activity, including building roads and bridges and traditional energy. And so this is really low hanging fruit. The other category that I would highlight uh, is, uh, has been the focus of one of the blue papers and was mentioned earlier by Peter Thompson, specifically seeing the ocean as a solution to climate change, not just as a victim of climate change. And specifically, 
thinking about the potential for reducing carbon emissions, not just the potential for adaptation, and it's important for both. But as Peter noted, through a combination of five different categories that we analyzed, there is the potential to uh, achieve as much as 21% of the carbon emission reductions that we need to get to the 1.5 degree target by 2050. So that's huge. So uh, renewable green energy, uh, greening shipping, protecting blue carbon ecosystems with nature-based solutions, uh, shifting seafood di or shifting diets of people to include more seafood instead of uh, animal protein from the land, all are significant and all add up. So in short, we have some win, win, win opportunities that connect ocean action directly to the things that people care about, whether it's reconnecting with nature for our own benefit, stimulating the economy, uh, creating jobs and providing new opportunities for people around the world. So time for action on those fronts. Terrific, uh, thank you so much, Jane. Um, uh, sticking with this, I'd like to turn to, sticking with this theme of, um, of uh, building back better, I'd like to turn to Vidar and we're now gonna segue into some of the really interesting questions that are uh, coming on the, on the Q&A line. And I'd be grateful if, um, Bid, unfortunately, it looks like Olai won't be joining, which is a, a great disappointment, but um, uh, we'll make sure she's on the next one because she is absolutely uh, wonderful speaking on behalf of her. She was chief negotiator for the small island developing states. She represents Palau in the, uh, in the United Nations as the, uh, as the ambassador there and has been ambassador of the European Union and really has been a total leader in this space. So, um, uh, so uh, follow her on Twitter. Um, uh, I'd ask the, the, uh, the, the panelists also to check the Q and A's and see which of these in particular you'd like to, uh, you'd like to answer. Um, and that includes you, Mary, I'd like to bring you back into the conversation. Um, Bida, um, on the economics, um, I mean, this, uh, this high level panel is on the ocean economy, if you like, the new ocean economy. Tell us why that is and why is it relevant to this building back better theme and what are we learning? Well, I think Jane just gave a very good case that there are opportunities in the ocean, uh, economic opportunities alongside social development opportunities that can go hand in hand with environmental protection and taking care of the regenerative capacity of the ocean. And if we're able to enable the, the ocean to regenerate, we can keep harvesting. And those opportunities uh, should be seized, but more than that, they really must be seized because there is more healthy, environmentally friendly, productive capacity in the ocean than there is, uh, in many cases, terrestrially. If you look at food production, we can produce way more protein in much more climate and environmentally friendly ways than we can terrestrially. Politically, it's a challenge that uh, um, we don't live in the ocean, so uh, political leaders often tend to have their back to the ocean. I think that's changing, but the high-level panel is certainly setting out to really changing the narrative, explaining that uh, we have great opportunities if we take better care of the ocean. And the examples that, that Jane mentioned are really science-based examples that those opportunities do exist. This is not political speak, but political action is needed to um, reap those opportunities. Mm. Thank you, Bida, very much. Um, I'd like to turn to the issue of inequity and um, the link between that and unsustainability. Um, maybe Mary um, and Jane could both, both address that. There's a wonderful um, a question in the Q and A um, from Jake Rice. Mary made a brilliant case for the urgency of ocean governance, addressing inequity as essential for progress. Um, addressing inequity, could you, um, Mary, say a word about that? And could you just dig a little deeper on the link between the absolute imperative of addressing inequality in the world 
um, if we are going to make progress and how does that link to reform of governance? I mean, obviously inclusion was one of your three themes. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. And thank you, Jace, Jake, for a really good question. Um, I, yeah, I think that the equity of, and the distribution of access to resources is a crucial both opportunity for us to enhance, but as you're saying, Jake, also it's a big challenge in managing something like a global commons resources in the ocean. And what we are seeing around the world is the downside of this. So if people's access to ocean resources is, is unfairly distributed, then as you say, then there are people who will harvest fish, cut down mangroves, um, fill wetlands, do illegal or unregulated activity because they don't feel like the system is fairly providing them access to resources as other parts of the society is. So that's the downside of inequity and why it leads to problems with ocean resource management and unsustainable practices. What we're seeing is that if people can engage in science policy processes, so the nice thing about the scientific process of learning, sharing knowledge, and then developing strategies and implementing them and monitoring to see their effects, that science process is, is a democratic process essentially. So if, as in Belize, you engage people across the economic and social spectrum, people who are deeply affected by the state of the ocean, and many coastal communities are like this, they intuitively understand how mangroves protect them, as Jane laid out, or how coral reefs provide their livelihoods for fisheries, but they need mechanisms to engage in the management of those resources and actually secure their access. So I've seen this happen over and over again in cases where very diverse parts of the spectrum of communities are engaged in articulating the problem itself and saying what is their shared vision and then if they are part of the solution and devising that solution, then you can really get into a, a more sustainable state. Um, like the Chilean turf example, for those of you guys who don't know it, where the user rights were established along a coastal region for these, these large limpets, they're called locos. And the, the local harvesters realized it was being over harvested and they set the regulations and set the rules by which the harvest would be enacted and they have learned over 15 or more years how to adapt that system that the people most affected by the harvest, the people whose livelihoods depended on it, designed it. And now there's much less poaching. There's not as much cheating um, by other areas along the coastline. And they've asked the central government in Chile to provide regulatory, these top-down mechanisms that secure the rights-based bottom-up innovations that came about. So that model, I think, is very scalable and replicable, but um, it's a challenge. We have to be intentional about putting it in place. And I think it all comes back to these democratic, engaged processes where people who um, are maybe not in having access to these governance and decision processes now are allowed in. Thank you so much, uh, Mary. Jane, I wonder if you'd like to add to that on the issue of equity. And um, I wonder if you could also um, address uh, another question that's here from a great friend of ours, Roger Sant, um, uh, who asked the question, the most successful ocean solution has been fully protected marine protected areas or no take zones. Why don't we try to rally the entire world around a goal of 30% protected areas by 3030? 30 times 30. How goes the battle on this, um, uh, Jane? And by the way, if anyone has a chance to come to Washington, go to the Museum of Natural History and go to the Sand Ocean Hall. It's wonderful. So thank you, Roger. Um, Jane. <clears throat> thanks, Andrew. And thanks for that question, Roger. Uh, this tension that we're talking about between the top down and the bottom up really goes to the heart of a lot of these global challenges. 
And it was prescient of you, Andrew, to mention Eleanor Ostrom in your opening remarks because she really uh, focused our attention on the importance of uh, having uh, solutions devolve to the lowest possible level, but consistent with uh, some global goals that are shared. And so this top-down, bottom-up um, tension that was really at the heart of this blue paper that Mary presented uh, is, is just so timely for all of these questions. Uh, we focused on the importance of governance and on leadership. Uh, and governance and leadership, people often tend to think of as being just this top down. But in my view, the top down needs to enable and empower the bottom up. And the bottom up gives legitimacy to the top down. So there are connections uh, that go back and forth. And any systems that are too far in one direction uh, or the other uh, often run into problems, especially at the global scale. So what we have seen is uh, a recent heightened awareness about the importance of equity, about inclusion, about diversity, and how those are connected uh, to justice, but also to these broader issues of um, climate change and ocean health. Uh, the kinds of participatory, inclusive um, uh, approaches to managing local areas are critically important. Uh, so if we have um, a marine protected area, for example, uh, many, many of the analyses that have been done by social scientists are telling us that those uh, fully protected, uh, implemented uh, areas that have been created through a participatory process are more successful because there is uh, because the local people have been uh, engaged in the process and have weighed in and have ownership and therefore uh, are better stewards of the resource because they uh, it wasn't imposed on them. And I think this has a very important lesson. And so as we focus on the overarching importance of taking better care of our ocean, one of the most powerful and least utilized tools that we have are these fully protected, implemented marine protected areas. Uh, currently, just a little over 2% of the global ocean is in those fully protected areas. As Roger has noted, there's an increased call for uh, supporting 30% in fully protected implemented areas. And this is borne out by the scientific information. We need healthy, productive, resilient ocean ecosystems. And we get those through these fully protected areas. But their creation needs to be a combination of this 30% aspiration that is enabled by top-down processes, but also is supported from bottom-up processes. And so we're going to see this continual uh, interaction between the top down and the bottom up. There's abundant scientific evidence that suggests that fully protected areas uh, not only protect biodiversity, but can enhance fisheries, uh, allow the fish and other and, and invertebrates, other things in there to grow very large. And when they're large, they produce a lot more young. That has knock-on consequences uh, and can replenish adjacent fisheries. And so it can be an important uh, fishery enhancement. We're also learning very importantly from the work of Enrique Sala uh, and a group that he is leading is that there is huge potential for marine protected areas to also protect stores of carbon that are in the sediment uh, of the floor, the ocean floor. And especially in coastal areas, there is now uh, a new awareness 
that these marine protected areas can have a triple bottom line impact, protecting stores of carbon, which is really important, uh, enhancing fisheries, and protecting biodiversity. So here is a win-win-win solution, if you will, uh, that is just waiting to be implemented. Uh, and I think there is uh, a, a great opportunity to move ahead in that direction. In concert, we also need to have better management of the rest of the ocean so that we have sustainable fisheries, sustainable aquaculture, sustainable other uses. And for far too long, the protection and the use components of the ocean have been at loggerheads. People have said, we need more fisheries, so we can't have more protected areas. That's not true. We really need both. It's not a choice of either one or the other. We need fully protected areas. We need uh, holistic, uh, smart, uh, sustainable fishery management. And we need to increase the amount of aquaculture, but it has to be sustainable. So big challenges, but we have solutions. This is not a situation where we don't have solutions at hand. We need, uh, we, we have the solutions. We need to look at these models. We need to scale them up. We need to uh, escalate them. And that's one of the reasons that I'm so excited about what the high level panel is doing. It's providing a deep dive into these uh, particular topics but also a mechanism for integrating across them. And Mary and her colleagues' paper on the uh, ocean transition uh, really informs how that integration might happen. What are the key lessons learned that uh, we can use to move forward? Great, thank you so much, uh, Jane. Um, and you're dead right about the, the um, the, the, the high-level panel was set up with, with sort of three goals, if you like, for a sustainable ocean um, economy. First, effective protection. Second, sustainable production. And third, equitable prosperity. And um, it's a jigsaw puzzle. It's not, um, there's, there, there, there's not a silver bullet. You need all three if we're going to make, um, make progress. Vida, um, I'll give you a choice now. Uh, you've looked through some of the questions and answers. If you want to pick one, please do. Otherwise, I will ask you one. What's your choice? <laughs> your okay. choice. My, my choice is for you to choose. Ah, okay. Well, then I'm going to pick a difficult one. Um, so uh, there are two questions here, and I'd like you both to, uh, all three of you, to think about them. First on deep seabed mi mineral mining. Um, uh, here's somebody here uh, uh, from um, from uh, a small island developing state from the Cook Islands, um, very concerned about um, deep sea um, metal and mineral uh, mining. Um, and then uh, that's Imogen Ingram. And then Julum Leon talks about increased incidence of underwater mining. So that's that's one set of issues. Another set, if someone else would like to think about, a very good question on a tourism. Tourism in small island, um, uh, distant from many markets. Uh, tourism is, is gonna take a, a long time potentially to recover due to restrictions on travel, higher cost of airfares. Is there a way of being creative, using the economy of the ocean, maybe getting you know, figuring out whether we get higher prices for fish or is there anything there that we can say that is constructive? I mean, maybe there's some financial points. So take your pick, Abida. <clears throat> um, let me touch on the mining question, which is indeed um, a very important one and very tricky one, where you have negotiations uh, under the Seabed Authority on um, situation in international waters and then obviously you have um, some countries pursuing opportunities for uh, deep sea mineral exploration and extraction in their national waters. Um, evidently for many important purposes the world needs more minerals and metals including for renewable energy production um, and the density apparently of uh, minerals is much higher in uh, uh, seabed minerals than, than onshore. And a number of social effects of uh, 
uh, mining onshore can be um, uh, avoided by, by offshore mining. On the other hand, obviously, there is so much we don't know about what these ecosystems on the seafloor entail. We do know that there are extreme forms of life that uh, are still to be uh, explored. And we do know that there are uh, opportunities for um, medical uh, purposes. We do know that the test for COVID-19 has been um, produced with the help of an enzyme from uh, microbes uh, in the deep sea. Uh, so we need to avoid mining coming to the detriment of uh, bioprospecting or other opportunities. And we need to avoid uh, mining um, and certain minerals harming the biodiversity. And that's why there is a strong need for more science and there is a strong need for the precautionary principle to be taken really seriously uh, by countries when it comes to their own waters and internationally in the negotiations taking place uh, in the International Seabed Authority. Thank you, Vida, very much. I wonder whether, Mary, you've looked at any questions you would like to answer. Um, alternatively, I'll ask you one. Um, go ahead. And by the way, let's now try to keep the answers fairly brief because we've got lots of really interesting questions here. Mary and then Jane. Yeah, thank you. I, I liked um, Emma Jin's question about the tourism sector that you mentioned, Andrew. I think this is a big problem and challenge, as she's saying. And We've been working with the Inter-American Development Bank as one example for all 26 Latin America in the Caribbean countries to think about this build back better um, idea that you mentioned, Andrew and others, around how do we stimulate economic recovery post-COVID? So that, that's a really important question. And this issue about tourism being the, the mainstay of many economies of coastal nations in the Latin American Caribbean region is a big challenge. So two things that have come up for job and livelihood support to really stimulate economic recovery using nature-based solutions have been what she mentions. One is fisheries so that you can think about licensing fisheries for sustainable food production. So getting to market in new markets and also using the stimulus money to certify um, both for local purposes of aquaculture and wild caught fisheries. So there's a lot of opportunity around that sector that hasn't been fully developed and it doesn't rely on tourism visitation. So that, that's one, I think, really promising um, avenue. It's going to mean different access to markets. So for example, in the Bahamas, there are some new loans coming to get fisher folk from the remote family islands to get their fish to market. The second one quickly is around disaster risk resilience and disaster risk reduction. Um, and as Jane mentioned, the, the restoration economy using wetlands, mangroves, seagrasses, other coastal habitats, that generates jobs very quickly and it has lasting impact in terms of doing that kind of coastal restoration activities that then confer resilience to sea level rise and storms as, as the, the climate continues to change and warm in directions that are putting many of those communities at greater risk. And for both of those arenas, the access to more um, high-end fisheries markets and the restoration economy for hazard reduction, um, blue carbon finance is a really emerging opportunity to bring new uh, sources of funding through these NDCs under the Paris Accord and lining up those sources of funding from multilateral banks as well as the blue carbon NDCs, um, people think is a really, really good opportunity and we're just starting to connect those dots. So thanks for a good question, Imogen. Mm. Thank you, uh, Mary. Jane, um, you may want to pick up that, that, that thread, but also I'd be grateful if you would um, address a couple of interesting questions here on energy. Um, one a very specific question, a very good one about many African countries now and many low-income countries are finding fossil fuels. They like to exploit them. 
but actually there are better long-term things that you could do, including some new technologies. Question here from Anthony Fresco about, um, about uh, uh, electrostatic fields of the, of the salt dissolved in the ocean. Could, could a subsidy be given to forego combustion of fossil fuels to find um, some new uses? Um, so too, more broadly, um, you know, energy from the ocean, whether it's wind or, 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 or uh, hydrogen technologies, um, offers huge possibilities. I mean, the high-level panel last summer brought out a really a, a remarkable paper on the role of the ocean in addressing climate change and concluded that in addition to everything that the ocean does today in absorbing so much carbon and so much heat, um, it could, uh, in addition to that, solve 20% uh, of the gap that we need to fill. There's also a question on uh, energy here implicitly from Rajan, um, uh, 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 who asks the question here about essentially technology transfer, the licensing of patents. Are there issues here that we can engage in maybe subsidizing for lower income countries? Over to you, Jane. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's, uh, those are a lot of really important questions, and I'm not sure I can do justice to all of them. Um, one thought is that uh, across all of those questions, there are underlying issues of equity and uh, finance and incentives. Uh, the equity issues are really access to technology, access to or opportunities to develop uh, so that's the equity component of these. The uh, incentives issue, so much of what drives um, what we know to be uh, destructive activities, use of fossil fuels, um, subsidies in fisheries, uh, illegal, unregulated, unreported fishing, uh, the perverse incentives are often driving a lot of those. And so one of the key roles, I believe, of governments is to pay attention, not to trying to control everything, but to creating the incentives that enable the kind of uh, progressive, <clears throat> um, equitable opportunities uh, that bring benefit, not harm. And the role of governments in doing that is really important. One of the questions that you didn't mention goes to the heart of subsidies with fisheries. And so I wanted to just work that in because that really is um, an important opportunity to uh, address those perverse incentives, get rid of those uh, incentives that are driving destructive behavior. But the same is true in terms of the pricing and the opportunities that are available for energy. Uh, and so, if uh, it is deemed desirable to address climate change, which is uh, you know, of paramount importance, um, it's sheer folly to be pursuing more uh, drilling and exploration for oil and gas. We really need to be changing the economic equations, the incentives, so that, especially for developing countries, there are opportunities for uh, renewable energy. And we've seen with the blue paper uh, on this topic how important uh, the uh, focusing on ocean-based opportunities are in this space. So um, <clears throat> focusing on incentives, on finance, uh, but also equitable access uh, to technology, to finance, uh, etc. Uh, are some of the themes that I see linking across those issues. Um, if I might, Andrew, one of the other questions uh, focuses on the importance of simple communications uh, in enabling broader sharing of information to everyone. Uh, so yes, we need highly technical analyses, we need very sophisticated scientific information, uh, but we also need uh, that information to be accessible to everyone. And uh, I would mention, since we've talked about fully protected marine areas, marine protected areas, uh, that we have just created 
um, a new comic book, which is called The Graphic Guide to MPAs. And I'll put the link to that in the chat function so that everybody can uh, see that. Uh, but it is, uh, I think, a nice example of how to take a wealth of scientific information uh, and make it more accessible to non-technical lay audiences in ways, in this case, that I think is a, a fresh way to do that. So I just want to underscore that important point about equitable access to information by paying attention to the ways that we are sharing information. That's great. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, we actually also had a question here from Phil Karp on, um, or referring to those uh, comic books as well. I wonder whether, um, Vidar, we could continue this theme of incentives, first fishing, because there's a, obviously a politi there's an economic dimension, social dimension, political dimension here. Um, uh, Marcia Chamboti asks the question that Jane referred to that we've agreed under SDG 14.6 to eliminate subsidies in fisheries or at least reduce them considerably. I can't remember that. I don't know the current number. Last time I looked, it was about $40 billion uh, being basically paid not to small fisher people, but to large factory uh, ships um, that are actually hurting poor people, hurting poor, poor fisheries. I mean, totally, you know, a ridiculous uh, situation. Um, what, what's, uh, and yet, obviously, there are a few countries that are doing this, and, uh, you know, there are high-level negotiations going on. The World Trade Organization is sort of thinking about this as well. Sort of where, how do you assess prospects um, on that this year? And then on the same theme of sort of the value of nature, there's an interesting question here on uh, the value of a whale. Uh, if somebody here, I can't find it, suggests that a whale um, costs, if you want to buy one, um, about $2 million. Um, surely it's worth more than that being left in the sea. Um, uh, is there this notion of subsidizing, using economic incentives and so on? Where do we stand on that with regard to the high level panel? Well, the high level panel is, um obviously working to uh, come up with proposals on how the ocean and the ocean economy can support all SDGs. And as we look at the SDGs, uh, there are a few deadlines expiring this year. And subsidies is indeed one of those deadlines. Uh, the world agreed to eliminate harmful fishery subsidies by this year. Uh, we have agreed to uh, establish 10% uh, uh, MPAs this year. Uh, we have agreed to eliminate or end IUU fishing this year. Obviously, it's very hard to be an optimist as to achieving that this year, uh, but it just means we need to reinforce um, policies and actions and collaboration to uh, make that happen over the next few years. Um, 2030 is the overall timeline for uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, and uh, the ocean can play and needs to play an incredibly important role in achieving them. Uh, and political leadership can make that happen. I can't comment on what proposals the panel will come up with because uh, that's for the principles to produce later. Thank you, Vida. My dog also barked just a little while ago, but luckily I was muted. So thanks very much for that. We're getting to know in this uh, era of Zoom, we're getting to know people much more personally than we knew before, seeing into their homes. Um, let's see, uh, Mary, we're heading to the, the end time now. Um, give you the chance to look through the existing questions, Mary and uh, Jane, uh, if you'd like to pick one and answer it and maybe, maybe make any sort of closing comments you might want to make. Yeah, thank you. I, I like this question about, from Camilla about education. So she asks, other than education programs, how can people that are not in coastal communities be included in the support and push of more sustainable practices? And I, I think that's an excellent question. Some people will be directly involved um, in these processes and they see it and live and breathe it every day. Others who might be a little bit farther removed but really care about these issues, I can think of at least two ways that they can be involved. And one is through 
their consumer choices. So uh, as in, in many countries and around the world, there are now international certifications and commitments by providers of food and other products that are based on ocean um, materials to be certified as sustainable and use standards to demonstrate that. So the Marine Stewardship Council is a famous one for fisheries, but there are many, many others. So that's one way in which people in communities around the world can get involved and assert their values for a more sustainable ocean system. And the other one is through work. So as, as we've all talked about on this panel today, the ocean is an incredibly interconnected system and many activities that many people do in there, some livelihoods are directly attached to the ocean, but there are many, many others that are indirectly attached that we may not even think about. So you can think of renewable energies um, sector, infrastructure sector, and technology sector. Um, the explosion of new data and information systems around understanding what is the state of the ocean, what are the impacts of our policies, and how is it responding? The tech sector and the inter, inter, infrastructure sector and energies and more could get more involved in sustainable practices that way as well. So thank you for that question. And also thank you all just for listening today. And I would just like to say that I, my, my takeaway message I think is since the ocean is interconnected. As an ecologist, I see that very clearly, but as many of our esteemed panel members have explained today, and we all see, I'm sure those of you on the, on the chat today understand intuitively that our, our very lives and livelihoods and well-being are connected to the ocean, and that if we think about this recovery that we're all seeking and this build back better notion after this pandemic is starting to abate. If we think about the ocean as supporting that in a positive way and stimulating that recovery in a, in a more sustainable future, I think we can get some really good ideas about what steps to take next to get us on that path. So thank you all very much. And thank you, Andrew, for being a great moderator. Thank you, Mary, very much. Jane, uh, pick a question. <clears throat> So um, I really want to pick up on uh, the, some of the points that Mary made. Uh, and again, these sort of cut through some of the different questions. Um, the, um, a, a lot of what is at the heart of our use of the ocean um, is how we think about the ocean. And what are the narratives that we use to uh, talk about the ocean? What is the conceptual framework that we have? And a, a, a conversation that you began, Andrew, when the high-level panel was first started, that the high-level panel has really embraced, which is thinking about what is a new narrative for the ocean that uh, is going to serve us. And the focus on um, the need to have a triple bottom line, which is to protect to produce and to prosper is really uh, goes to the heart of what the high level panel is trying to do. How do we connect those things? What does that actually look like? Especially in this heightened awareness world of the interconnectedness of people, of people with nature, of nature with the economy, of our health, all of that is so interconnected. And the new narrative that is emerging says that you know, for the vast period of human history, people's narrative about the ocean has been that it was so immense, so bountiful, so endlessly resilient, that it was simply too big to fail. It was just impossible for people's actions to have an impact on the ocean. We could take as much out as we wanted, and in terms of putting things in, if dilution is the solution to pollution, you know, who could imagine a larger place to have everything be diluted? So what does it matter? So the notion that the ocean was too big to fail has been the dominant narrative for most of human history. In the last couple of uh, years, 
uh, we have seen the folly of that narrative. The problem is for certain um, people that, uh, th th that too big to fail narrative continues to persist. And as we look to new use of the ocean, sometimes that narrative is still out there. It's so big, it doesn't matter. But the folly of that narrative uh, has really been uh, painfully obvious to people whose livelihoods depend on the ocean, to anybody who's paying attention to what's happening with increasing bleaching, uh, really disgusting plastic pollution, crashing fisheries in many parts of the world, uh, lots of pollution, harmful algal blooms, uh, the litany goes on and on. <clears throat> and so the new narrative that has taken over for many people is that, oh my gosh, these problems are just too complicated. The drivers are too ingrained. Uh, the vested interests are too powerful we now are thinking of the ocean as too big to fix. There's a lot of doom and gloom about the ocean that is out there. I believe, and the high level panel believes, that that narrative is also a false narrative. And the new one that is emerging, for which there's ample uh, information across all the blue papers, is that the ocean is actually the path forward. It is key to solving climate change. It is key to restoring uh, our economy. It is key to so many things that we think about. It is central, it's so big, it's so central, it's so important that it is too big to ignore. And so this new narrative about the ocean says, it's not too big to fail, it's not too big to fix, but it is absolutely too big to ignore and we need to act on that knowledge. So this new narrative, I think, is an important way to think about some of the specific questions, whether it's mining, drilling, tourism, whatever it is. Thinking of that through this new narrative uh, is, I think, uh, a, a powerful way to not be constrained by our narratives, but to be liberated by them. And I think that's a, a great inspirational call to action. It certainly is, Jane. That was brilliant. Thank you. I know um, I saw a draft of a paper that you were writing, and I hope you've published it. I mean, this notion that we used to believe too big to, to fail, then too big and too complex to fix. And now we, we've got to point out both of those uh, are, are wrong. We, it's too important to ignore. So if it is published, please, everybody read it. It's really quite inspiring. Um, Ambassador Helgeson, we'll give you the last word um, uh, if, if you want to pick a question, but probably more useful would be, you know, a year from today, two years from today, what do you hope the high-level panel will have delivered? Obviously, the high-level panel was supposed to have its big moment at the, uh, at the um, Ocean Summit uh, this month uh, in Lisbon, and obviously that's been postponed by a year, so it gives us another year to work on it. Um, what are you really hopeful for? Well, first of all, the High Level Panel has been so far an exciting journey um, in science-informed policymaking. Uh, the launch of this blue paper, uh, now in the COVID-19 situation, we've been extending the launch of blue papers. And uh, this, amongst the other blue papers, have been informing um, the policy recommendations that we are developing and that will further develop in light of, of the impact of COVID-19 and looking at how the ocean economy can help uh, the world accelerate the transition going forward. Uh, so the science policy interface is really critical, but what we'll also focus a lot on from here on is the policy action interface, uh, building coalitions of key actors that can partner with the governments on the high level panel, um, multinational institutions, private sector not the least, and continue to be informed by science, acting on that knowledge we have and acting on those opportunities that Jane so eloquently talked about and make things happen. We, there's a lot we don't know about the ocean, but there is also a fair bit that we do know. And 
we need really um, to focus not only on the policy recommendations, but on the action opportunities. And that's why having sitting and serving uh, political leaders, presidents and prime ministers on the panel is important. Uh, most commissions have past presidents or past prime ministers. These are sitting and serving leaders and they uh, uh, are drivers for action. And uh, in this case, informed by science. So that's uh, where we're moving based on the fantastic science, including Mary's paper. Uh, we'll move to policy recommendations, but at the same time, we'll design actions that need to be taken if we are to get to 2030 and have a sustainable ocean economy serving the uh, SDGs by now. Great. Thank you so much, Vida, and thank you, everybody. All uh, uh, We were up to 150. We're now down to still over 100, though. It's, uh, it's been fantastic to have you all here. Let me just say that, you know, on behalf of the World Resources Institute, it's a great honor for us to um, host the Secretariat for the High Level Panel. We think it's uh, doing a very exciting work. Deeply grateful to our three uh, panelists, uh, Jane Lubchenko, Mary Ruckelshaus, and Vida Helgeson. And in absentia, Her Excellency Olai um, Uludong. Um, and we're sorry she wasn't here, but it's been a wonderful discussion anyway. Let me also thank Christian Telecki, the Director of the Secretariat, and Nicola Prost, who's the Deputy uh, Director. They're based in London. And uh, please feel free to contact them at any stage. I think you're on the screen now. You see the various, uh, the various links. So please, um, please uh, look at the, the blue papers and join us as we work for another year leading up to the Ocean Summit in the middle of next year. So thank you all for joining. Um, we give a round of applause for our panelists, but uh, we can't hear you. We'll just take that for granted. It's great to be with you all. Thank you so much.